She has a PhD from Indiana University where she studied Yiddish literature and its intersection with issues of translation and religion. So a perfect person, in fact, to have this conversation tonight. And our invited speaker and author, Miriam Udell, Associate Professor of German Studies and Jewish Studies at Emory mm -hmm. University, where her teaching focuses on Yiddish language, literature, and culture. She holds an AB in Near Eastern Languages and Civilization from Harvard University and a PhD in Comparative Literature from the same institution. She was ordained in 2019 as part of the first cohort of the Executive Ordination Track at Yeshivat Maharat, a program designed to bring qualified mid-career women into the Orthodox rabbinate. And finally, I did some research online and found out that she is the author of the book, Never Better, the Modern Jewish Picaresque uh, from 2016, which was the winner of the National Jewish Book Award in Modern Jewish Thought and Experience. So I am very excited to get this conversation underway. So welcome, Margot and Miriam. Thank you so much, Amy, for the, the invitation that I'm so excited to be in conversation with Margot. Yeah, thanks, Amy. And of course, thank you, Miriam. We're thrilled that you are here. So, okay. So a lot of people expressed interest in Yiddish stuff. So I'm going to ask you that question first, which is, this is a treasury of Yiddish children's literature. Why Yiddish children's lit? And then later on, I'm going to ask you the same question again, but I'm going to say, why Yiddish children's lit? So. Yeah, so um, part of the answer to that question is just the kind of reflexive, because it's there and because it's so good. Um, I started out uh, this inquiry in 2013. I had just finished writing the manuscript that would become my first book um, on the modern Jewish picaresque. And I was casting about for a new project and I had also been teaching Yiddish Sprach course and language courses pretty much every year um, from the time that I started teaching at Emory in 2007. And I was reflecting on how great it would be if I could find some sort of authentic Yiddish materials that I could share with my students that they would be able to read during the second semester of language instruction when they had some of the basic grammar down, but were just getting the past tense and didn't have a lot of vocabulary yet. And I thought about how every time I had studied a language until Yiddish, when I had studied Spanish and Hebrew and a little bit of Arabic, um, we had always read children's literature as part of the curriculum, and that had never been part of my Yiddish education. And it kind of made me wonder somewhat naively, well, is there any, was there any Yiddish children's literature? And I went to the big Eichler's bookstore in Borough Park in the heart of, you know, Hasidic Brooklyn, and I squatted on the floor because they had one shelf of Yiddish children's literature, and it was the bottom shelf, of course, and I saw all kinds of books that were either um, about animals or had a lot of gender stratifications that the little girl was helping her mommy cook for Shabbos and the little boy was learning Torah and then making Kiddush with his Tati. And I thought, okay, these are fine, but like, this is nothing that I want for my kids. And it's not anything that I particularly want for my students. Is there anything else? And I started searching on the internet and I discovered that there was this whole treasure trove just hiding in plain sight, by which I mean that the Yiddish Book Center had actually already scanned almost a thousand freestanding books of Yiddish children's literature. And they had even commissioned something called the Noah Coatsen Library, which was a project to have a kind of indefatigable team of I think six volunteers read through these hundreds and hundreds of works and summarize them. They had written these little synopses that were also freely available on the Yiddish, web, uh, Yiddish Book Center website. So I started poking around and reading through things. And I very quickly realized that a lot of it did not stand the test of time. Like it came across as very wooden, very doctrinaire, not really fun reading. It might 
be useful in a language classroom for emphasizing, you know, certain vocabulary or, or certain um, grammatical structures, but it wasn't anything that was going to be compelling for the general interest reader. But as I kept reading, I said, well, okay, but here's a really good one. And here's another really good one. And this one is excellent. And I realized that there was actually going to be an overwhelming amount of incredible material and that the problem would be whittling down. Um, so why Yiddish? Because it's there and it's great. And it gives us a window. We were joking about how so many of the, the Yiddish program you do end up having have to do with the Holocaust and this does too because it has to do with the whole Jewish 20th century um, but it really gives us a window into what Yiddish was like when it was young when it thought of itself as being young and vibrant and having a message for people who are young and and vibrant um, and wanting to speak to children so so I'll pause there yeah, okay. Um, right, so young and vibrant and um, very, you, you mentioned this in the introduction and I think like just glancing at the authors, if you're familiar with Yiddish literature, like there's a lot of politics um, and a lot of like different ideologies here. Is that connected to the, I mean, for me, it seems like that would be connected to the young Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So Yiddish children's literature arises as a as a project of Yiddish politics. And what I mean by that is that in the early decades of the 20th century, in the teens and then the interwar period in the 20s and 30s, there were several Yiddish political parties, all of which were part of what we would now call the left. So these really ranged from just Yiddish, which is kind of analogous to people who describe themselves today as just Jewish, meaning that there wasn't a really strong um, set of political commitments other than a privileging and a, a real dedication to the Yiddish language and to what what people understood to be the values of Yiddish culture rooted in Jewish religious texts and traditions, but appealing to a more secular audience that might no longer be observing all of the traditional laws and practices. So there was kind of just Jewish and there was um, Zionist socialist, who believed that the best feature for the Jewish people lay in creating a homeland in what was then Palestine or Eretz Yisrael, the land of Israel. Um, there were Bundists who were socialists of a, of a different, somewhat more internationalist stripe, um, who believed that the best Jewish future was going to be uniting the the workers of the world and having a robust Jewish identity that intersected with a robust socialist proletarian identity. And then all the way out on the left were the Farbrente Kommunisten, the, the ardent communists um, who believed that Yiddish was a great tool for reaching masses and masses of Jewish workers who happened to speak Yiddish. There was nothing about Yiddish in particular, other than that it was a great means of getting to these workers with the message. And the message was the brotherhood of all workers all over the world. And so each of these ideologies coalesced into political parties, both in Europe, in Warsaw, in Vilna, and in some other places in Jewish Eastern Europe, and in New York, and to somewhat more, somewhat lesser extent, other important Yiddish cultural capitals in the Americas. So we see some of this activity also in places like Los Angeles and Detroit and um, Montreal and Mexico City and Buenos Aires, right? And each of these political parties 
creates its own network of, of schools. They create their own school system so that you have a, a network of Sholem Alechem schools that are just Yiddish. You have a network of international workers order schools that are communist. And those schools need texts, they need books, they need textbooks to use in school. And they also develop publishing arms that can create um, kind of leisure time books that children can enjoy with their families at home or as independent readers at home. And so that's really the engine that drives the development of Yiddish children's literature during those decades. And so it is very politically rooted. And in some instances, the politics are subtle and it's more a question of the values underlying a certain political vision. And in other cases, the politics are right out there on the surface. Yeah, okay. So that's a wonderful like overview of all the possible positions that were out there. Um, and you know, you you chose stories that kind of come from all of those different, maybe not the most extreme, but all the different perspectives. Um, and my guess is that your um I know we're all up to here with politics and probably don't want to go too deep, but my guess is that your own set of beliefs don't necessarily line up exactly with any of these or with all of these authors whose perspectives are coming out in their stories. So like, how do you navigate that? Do you feel like you have a special, you have to, I don't know, like you have to change, yeah. Yeah, no, I see where you're going. And I really appreciate the question because as I was creating the table of contents, I actually worked really hard to, to ensure that there would be representation of that full range. So, um, you know, we have stories that maybe in a few minutes we'll talk about the Sabbath tales, which describe really traditional ways of observing Shabbos, of observing the weekly Sabbath, um, which come from leftists and we have the lobster stories which are explicitly communist but even while they're teaching you um, and you know teaching the child reader what communists cared about and why um, there are also these wonderful stories about a family and its dog and everyone loves a good story about a dog right um, and it was also really important to me to include um, Zionist stories. So we have a couple of those. We have Levine Kipnis, who um, moved to Eretz Israel pretty early in his life and became one of the major founding figures in Israeli children's literature in Hebrew. And he decides in the 50s to publish this one volume of holiday tales in Yiddish. And he he publishes it with um, Farlag Matonis, which is the the gifts press because he conceived of it as a gift for the children of the diaspora to read these highly Zionistic stories that would make them love the land of Israel and to bring these stories to them in the Jewish language that they had access to, which was Yiddish. I also include the, the single um, longest piece in the book is a, a intergenerational saga novella by Tzina Rabinovich that is very ardently Zionist about four generations of a family with the, the final generation. Um, the story ends in 1945, just after the, the end of the war. And the last um, generation of this family that we meet has survived the war and gone to a children's colony, which is to say a kind of community for orphans in, in Palestine, in pre-state Palestine. Um, so I, I tried to get all of that in there. And then once I decide to have the representation, it isn't so important you know, how my views align. It becomes a question of being the best possible translator that I can be for these texts and sort of putting myself into partnership with the authors. Okay, yeah, so this is gonna be my next question is like how, what is your, like how, 
how would you characterize your role as the translator? And it's like, you are partnering with the authors to share their stories. What kind of partnership is it? Like, is it 50-50? Um, how much of you, how much of you do you feel is entering into these stories? So I think that the only honest answer to that is more and more as time went on and I got my bearings as a translator and began to feel more confidence. Um, I think that when I started in 2013 and I was incredibly fortunate because when I was deciding to, to do this project, the Yiddish Book Center was just running the first year of its translation fellowship, which has since become very storied and it's produced all of these wonderful book length translations. And I think this is probably the project that took the longest to, to fully bake um, in the history of the program, but it's also, it's a long book. Um, it, it's compendious, I've, I've heard someone say. And so I was really fortunate that just at the moment that I was deciding to try this, there was somebody coming along to say, we can teach you how to translate. We can teach you some best practices. We can give you a place where you can kind of debate the merits of leaving more fingerprints or fewer fingerprints in the text of, you know, how you solve the kind of mechanical problems of the craft of translation. Um, so that was really good timing. And um, I became more more confident and I think um, had a more of, a, so in the beginning I was pretty slavish and I had to, to go back and revise and revise and loosen up and, and kind of loosen the sentences up and create a little bit more air. Um, there are definitely just systemic differences between any two languages. And so in Yiddish, there's, there are a lot of, um, a lot more repetition than we would really countenance in English. And at first I felt like, well, how can I elide that? How can I leave out a sentence or a phrase that's getting repeated? The author put it there. And I think over time I kind of chilled out because I realized that the nature of the partnership is that I am taking these, these primary texts and putting them into English and making them something that is going to be meaningful and engaging and lively for the English language reader with the kind of pacing and linguistic conventions that we actually use in English. So, so it's a balance, right? Because I didn't want to entirely elide or erase the sense of this being a foreign text that comes from a different time and a different place in many instances. Um, but I also really did want it to become wholly English. Great. So were there texts that were particularly difficult to do that with that you felt like this isn't going to happen? And then maybe one that like did happen? Yes. So one of the things that I mentioned in the introduction was that I would have loved to include, I feel like one of the, the major subgenres of Yiddish children's literature that I don't represent here is these wonderful alphabet books that were used to teach children the Hebrew Yiddish alphabet. And they were often illustrated at a time when relatively few books were being illustrated. Um, and they're full of puns and wordplay, and they're absolutely delightful. And I got as far as a title for one of them, which was, um, it's called in Yiddish, Der Bezer Bez, which is the angry letter base. Um, and I got the title, The Stinging Bee, but I couldn't get very far past that. Um, the puns were just too, dense for me to, to be able to replicate. Um, so I, I kind of let that one go. There's another one and I'm actually going to just read a, a couple of stanzas if you will indulge me. Um, there's one by Leib Kvitko, who was a Soviet Yiddish author. 
um, that I think is delightful and I knew I wanted to include it. It's a rhyming narrative poem. It reminds me of the work of Shel Silverstein. It's about a little boy who lives in a shtetl, loves to eat sweets, doesn't particularly like to read and hates to take a bath. And his name is Boots. And when I first looked at this, I felt like this is just such a great story. I'm gonna translate it prosaically. I'm not going to worry about making it rhyme. I'm just going to try to get a good, accurate rendering of what every word means. And if it's totally workmanlike, people will understand. Like, you're, I'm not a miracle worker, right? I'm a translator, not a miracle worker. So I did that. I got it down and I felt like, who knows whether I'll include it or not, but it's such a great story. I went off and I translated tens of thousands more words of Yiddish. I pretty much finished the project I had, or I thought I had finished the project. I had everything drafted and that was maybe like a third or fourth draft. I think that most of the translations went through seven or eight passes. So little did I know how much work still lay ahead of me, but I thought I had everything done. And I went back to Boots, Boots and the Bath Squad to see, could, oh, I remember, I wanted to write something about this, something brief for um, the literary journal Paper Brigade that the Jewish Book Council puts out. And I needed to translate just one stanza. And I thought, okay, maybe I can make one stanza rhyme. That's low pressure, right? And I did it. And I then I went back when everything was done and I wondered like, could I do another stanza? And so I ended up translating the whole poem into rhyming verse. And I'm gonna just read you a little bit of it. So we meet this boots. Off somewhere in a shtetl far flung lived a boy, one of those guys with shining eyes and cheeks for weeks and such a tongue. To him, a book might as well be a brick. Just keep the sweet crepes coming quick and pancakes and dumplings for his tummy's grumblings, plate after plate, and then a smidgen more he ate. Before the boy could even swallow, he'd wink and check what more might follow. Hey, is there anything left in the pot? He'd overturn it on the spot. And hey, when you're gorging and noshing, who so much as thinks of washing? And hey, when there's strudel and fruitcake for grazing, who so much thinks of bathing? So that's his situation, right? There are no parents home. He's eating all the sweets. He's not taking any baths. And this being Soviet Russia, the state is very involved in the care and maintenance of children. In fact, what I was writing about for that piece in Paper Brigade is that parents are often either totally missing in action or they're utterly incompetent. So in this case, we just don't see or hear about the parents. And so I'll tell you what happens in verse. The thing was bound to come to pass. The door it opened up, alas, without so much as a knock. And who should come in, in a flaxen smock so tall and thin? The bath man. And then another, and yet another, neither smaller than the other. Thus spake the bath man, no more, no less. Why, that's him, yes! And he pointed out the lad. Soon as his words reached the boy's ears, one of his eyes filled up with tears, and the dumpling he was eating, well, it knew not what to do. That dumpling got stuck in his throat mid-chew. The bath man sang out, shrill as trumpets metal. A cold is going round the shtetl. What a punk, what a craw. Such filthy funk, his dirty maw. Grab that boots, that grubby schlub. Drag him over to the tub. Turn on the taps, no time to cosset. it. Hurry, get him to that faucet. And so they take this boy and they forcibly bathe him and it's, it's violent, but it's all very funny. He has a pair of socks that are caked onto his, onto his feet that are entirely encrusted in dirt and they have to soak off the socks. So midway through the bath, um, he starts out you know, thrashing and crashing and then midway the socks float up to the surface and 
he actually realizes that it's nice to be clean and he gets out of the bath and he shakes the bath man's hand. Um, he didn't recognize himself sitting on a chair so grand. He reached to shake the bath man's hand, which is also, you know, a kind of a, a horrifying point, to be frank, about the way that the dream of the Soviet system um, transforming the backwater regressive shtetl by making the Jew, by remaking the Jew, cleansing him so that he was literally unrecognizable to himself. But we don't have to go into that part when we read it to an eight-year-old. Hey, thanks. Then facing the men who, as you'll recall, could neither of them be said to be small and taking his time lazy and sweet, he chirped, now I could go for a bite to eat. So Boots ends up having the last word um, and he's going to revert to, to his, his norm. Um, so it's, it's by no means a, a tragic poem. And that, that was the hardest, the, the hardest thing that I actually managed to pull off, I would say. So thank, thank you, you for letting awesome. me take you on that. Yeah. Yeah, it's awesome. But you talked about like, I wouldn't, you said something like I wouldn't um, talk about this with an eight year old. We have a lot of teachers here mm -hmm. um, and they're interested in how they could use this book in the classroom. Yeah. Do you have um, thoughts about that? I have so many thoughts about that because I was, I was really fortunate. Um, one of the ways that this book got written was with support from, from Emory, from my university, through an interdisciplinary faculty fellowship. I was able to partner with a child psychologist and an anthropologist, and we convened a faculty graduate student seminar. And they knew some people in the community that they also invited to the seminar. And one of those was a really trailblazing educator, now retired, um, named Barbara Rosenblatt. And people in Jewish education circles might know her because I, I know she does a lot of um, leadership in professional development circles. And she got really interested in this material. And she was at the Weber School at the time, which is a non uh, sectarian, or sorry, not non sectarian, a community school, non. Um, denominational is the word I wanted, Jewish community school here in Atlanta. And she got some of the other faculty interested. And the at the time, the school had a special mini mester during the month of January when teachers would create these immersive, intensive mini courses for the students. And a number of the teachers actually ended up using material from you know what would become Honey on the Page. Um, somebody created a puppet theater and a puppet show based on another story by that same author, Leib Kvitko, a nanny goat with seven kids. Um, somebody who is passionate about making pop-up books and paper arts, paper cutting and paper arts, ended up teaching a seminar about how to do that, taking The Wind That Got Angry by Meisha Kulbach as her text. Um, there were a couple of other classes that used a lot of the stories. And the ones that I think got the, the most use at Weber in these various January mini master projects tended to be fables or literature that had a sort of a folk quality to it. And teachers were able to do a lot with um, with these fables and placing them in conversation with Aesop's fables and other, and Jean de la Fontaine and other kind of global fable storytelling traditions and doing comparative things and having the, the students do creative things. So I think that there's actually a lot and you know, you'll have better ideas than I do about how to use these stories with um, with other ages and levels, but it's really rich material. I would also say, oh, my four-year-old reclaimed his copy and it's no longer next, it's no longer in my Zoom studio, it's gone back upstairs. I would also say that um, for that, that Meisha Kulbach story about the wind that got angry, one of the first adult students that I had in a course that I 
taught about this material at the YIVO Institute in 20, 20 what, 2016, 2015, was a children's author named Linda Elevitz Marshall. She's a very prolific children's author. And she was really inspired by the wind that got angry. And she said, you know what? The story needs an update. I'm going to adapt this wonderful story, which I think is a story about a temper tantrum. And I'm going to modernize it by creating a child protagonist and having like a problem solving attitude among the children in the story. And so she did that and she wrote a beautiful picture book that was published in winter of 2019 called Goodnight Wind. And you can find it, I mean, it's definitely still in print with paper cut illustrations by Mael Doliveau and they turned out beautifully. And so taking the source material and seeing how she adapted it could be a really fun exercise. And that's a great story. And I, I think I'm, I think I'm allowed to say, I think I'm not spilling any state secrets if I say that that story is actually being adopted as part of the PJ Library lineup. And so it will be out in, I don't know, about a year or so. Um, so that's that's exciting. Um, I'm, by the way, I'm giving another iteration of that class about Yiddish children's literature at YIVO this winter and it will all be online. So if you get really interested or if you wanna be in a continuing conversation and think about um, how to incorporate this into the classroom, maybe somebody has professional development funds that would pay or subsidize your tuition for the YIVO class. Awesome. So, <laughs> um, that was the question from Lisa. And if other people have questions, feel free to put them in the chat and I will um, try to pass them along. Or if you raise your hand, we can um, take them. Oh, we've already got one. Okay. Leah, is that, are you Leah or Leah? Leah? Leah, it's fine. I'm just wondering, um, could you post maybe some links? I'm not familiar with most of these books that you're, or most of these stories and authors that you're quoting. I'm wondering if mostly everybody else is and- I guarantee um, you they're not because most of this material is being translated into English for the very first time. So is there is there like a link where we could like, or, or somewhere where we could see some of this that you're, some of the books that you're quoting? So everything that I'm talking about is in Honey on the Page. Um, and let's see. Yes, we can get out some links. Do you, will you send out like a, a roundup to people who registered tomorrow if I give you some links? The, there, was a, there was a story that was excerpted um, in the Yiddish digital journal in Geveb at Passover time because it was a great story for quarantine. It was an adaptation of a, um, of a midrash, of a Talmudic midrash that appears in Tractate Sota about the, the generation of little boys growing up, Moses's contemporaries growing up in um, Pharaoh's Egypt. And the idea in the midrash is that the children, that these little boy children who had been declared illegal by the cruel Pharaoh um, were actually hidden by their mothers in the ground, in little cradle pits that were dug out for them, and that they were able to subsist on, on um, honey and oil during, during the time of, um, during the time between their birth and the exit. It is. And Levin Kipnis, whom I mentioned earlier, um, he's the one who lives in the land of Israel and writes this one book of holiday tales in Yiddish. And he writes a long, beautiful adaptation of the Midrash about how these children were nurtured during this long period when they had to be in a kind of protective isolation. And so it, it ran around Passover when we were all looking at Seder in place for the first time and you know being without family for Passover. And so um, 
that one is still up online. Um, Harvard Magazine just ran a little excerpt of from the book. So there, there are excerpts here and there online that I can sort of point you to. And there's also a lot collected on my website if people go to miriamudel.com. So, so um, oh, sorry. Go ahead. I'd say if, if Miriam, if you have a, a list of resources, if you send them to me through Ariana um, or Amy, I can then get them out to all the teachers that are here tonight. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Yeah. One of our faculty members, Matt Polly, has his hand up. So um, go ahead and ask your question. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Miriam, for a really fascinating uh, conversation. So the story you just read to me, um, so I should explain, I'm a historian of Russia and Eastern Europe, and I specialize in Soviet Ukraine. I wrote a book on uh, Soviet Ukrainian uh, schooling in the 1920s and 1930s and touched on Yiddish language. My ideal reader. Good, right, exactly. <laughs> uh, absolutely. Well, I have a lot to learn from you, clearly. Um, it struck me the story you just read has to do with uh, the Soviet campaign for public hygiene, which was not just particular to, to Jewish children, right. but, but was for the Soviet population as a whole and certainly the rural population. So I, I'm uh, curious to know how much you see the non-Jewish uh, environment and culture um, uh, influencing some of these stories or referenced in some of the stories. Um, also know a little something about the Kultura Liga in Kiev uh, and its mm -hmm. sponsorship of children's literature. And I'm wondering how much difficult subjects like uh, the, the programs of 1919 were, were referenced in these works of literature in a way that children would understand. And then lastly, if I may, it was the Soviet Union in the business of import, uh, exporting some of these um, uh, collections of children's literature or journals of children's literature to um, Poland, to other places beyond the borders of the Soviet Union for Yiddish language readers elsewhere. Thank that you. is a that's yeah that's a great question. Um, okay, let me go back and see if I can remember all three questions. I'm sorry, I'm functioning sorry. Functioning on on the little bit of sleep that everyone's getting these days. Um, so, you you asked about um, th right. So non Jewish influences. So there is a story that I did not include um, called Dovedo uh, un Shaykhali which is about a friendship between a Jewish and an Armenian boy. And it's very idealistic and it's very, um, it's very much that sense of a multi-ethnic, multi-confessional empire finding um, unity of purpose under the big Soviet tent, right? And so the reason I didn't include it is because what happens over the course of the story is that this little Jewish boy and this little Armenian boy who are friends um, make a parade with their, like their pots and pans. And it's a delightful idea, but the story just doesn't, sustain, like there's not enough action. It's way too long, but there's not enough interesting thing that happens. It's just a really sweet, really boring story. Um, but there was definitely material being produced like that, that was very, you know, consciously sending the, the message about a kind of idealized relation between an ethnically marked Jewish you know, Soviet citizen and a, a differently ethnically marked Soviet citizen all kind of coming together. Um, Leib Kvitko is a really interesting figure for this because Leib Kvitko, and I, I do include, so I have Boots and the Bath Squad. I have a nanny goat with seven kids and did I end up? With? No, and I didn't, that's it in the collection. But I've translated a few other stories of his. He was the most prolific of the Soviet Jewish Yiddish, Soviet Yiddish authors. And um, he has a 
a story called uh, Oi, when I grow up. And it's about this little boy who loves, loves, loves horses. And he particularly loves the horses of the Red Army. And he goes somewhere that he can see the stable and he can see the konyches, the stable hands who take care of these horses and how um, strong and gentle they are and how unafraid they are to move among these huge horses. And that's part one of the, of the story and it's all told in verse. And then part two, he's the fifth child in this family and he goes through all of the different occupations that his older siblings have. There's a, um, there's a brother who's a weaver and there's a brother who's a writer and there's a sister who's a flierin, like a flyer. And it, the picture shows a parachutist. So that's kind of cool. And um, there's another sibling who's still in school and he says, but uh, I want to be with the horses, right? Like, that's the life for me. And then in the third part of the story, he meets Marshal Semyon Budioni, um, the, the uh, leader of the Red Cavalry. And he gets kind of sized up by Marshal Budioni, who tells him, if you work hard in school and you, you know, you keep going along the straight path, you can join the Red Cavalry someday. And that's like his dream. So the thing about Leib Kvitko is that he had print runs in the thousands, 3,000, 3,500, 10,000. And I'm sure you know that it was customary in these um, Soviet books to actually list the print, the number of the print run, which is incredibly helpful to scholars today, right? So Leib Kvitko is befriended by Korne Shukhovsky and he becomes Leo Kvitko in Russian and Shukhovsky sees to it that his work gets translated into Russian where it starts to enjoy print runs in the millions. So I don't actually know the answer about export. I think it's an interesting question. I, I would think maybe Ken Moss at Hopkins might know that and it would be worth like an email to him. Um, and I'm curious now, so I don't mind sending that email. But um, what I do know is that within the Soviet Union, these stories kind of de-Judaized, Russified, achieved very, very wide very mass circulation. Great, thank you. Um, I think I saw a hand earlier from Annette. You are still muted, Annette, sorry. Do you know how to unmute yourself? Okay. I certainly do, thank you. Um, I wanna thank you, it's a great background and uh, it's a very, very thorough context building. So I have a, a specific question slash request. Your table of contents. Yeah. How, I don't, I'm not gonna ask you to read the, the, the whole table, but how is it set up? That's a now great that question. Now I have the background, I, yeah. you know, I can deal with that. I That's can, a great can question. do a share screen um, if you want with my digital copy while you're explaining it. That would be fantastic. We try so that? I realized very early on that if I wanted to create a book that would be fantastic for historians and sell maybe 150 copies, then I should organize it all chronologically um, or by contact, by you know what got published in which place. But if I wanted to create a resource for children, families, educators, a much wider audience, then the best way to organize it would be thematically. And so I made that decision pretty early on and that it would be a thematic mode of organization. And then the question was, okay, so how do you pick the themes and how do you group the themes and what's the overarching principle? So I looked at a lot of anthologies from the 20s and the 30s and even going back to the teens and I saw that the mode of organization without necessarily announcing itself as such was often that an anthology would start with the most distinctively 
or particularistically Jewish content and broaden out from there. So I decided that I, I would do something similar. I start with Jewish holiday stories, which I think will be useful in Jewish classrooms of all kinds, whether they're day schools, Sunday schools, you know, whatever it might be. So Jewish holiday stories beginning in the biblical fashion with Passover and going through the year from there. Um, then I move on to Jewish history and heroes. And some of these are um, actually one of these, the life of Don Yitzchak Abravanel purports to be nonfiction, although pitched at a kid level, we would now think of it as kind of middle grade. Um, and the others are historical fiction. And then I move on to folk tales, fairy tales, wonder tales. In other words, the kind of folkloric literature that we would expect to see parallels to in just about any traditional culture, but obviously with a, a very Jewish frame of reference. And then there's a section on wise fools, which are your helm stories, your stories about baggarts, um, stories that are just kind of fun and light and some sort of a, you know, a joking sensibility. That's an important part of children's literature. Then on to allegories, parables, and fables. Now these are becoming more universal in their in their messaging. A lot of these um, have to do with um, kind of universal virtue messages like emotional regulation, like gen the importance of generosity. Um, Although some of them are still quite Jewish, like Eliezer Steinberg's stories from Genesis, which is about transposing some of the Genesis stories into an avian setting with, with birds. And to be perfectly honest, that one is mostly there for my mom, who, who loves birds. Um, I like it too. I, I wrote my first academic article about Eliezer Steinberg and his fables, and I wanted to translate something of his that had never before been translated. Um, then I go to a pretty universal theme for most kids, at least until coronavirus hit, which is school days and the school setting, the school environment and the kinds of lessons that we learn in and around school. And then from there to the kinds of lessons that we learn outside of school in life's classroom. And finally, I conclude with the most universal theme of all, which is families, but of course, Jewish families, right? And Jewish families in all different kinds of locations and circumstances, whether it's a very modern uh, Warsaw of the 1930s or a farm outside of Boston or, or Brooklyn. Um, and so that's the way that things are kind of organized. Thank you, it's terrific, thank you. Oh, thank you for answering, Lynn. Yes, it was the wind that got angry. Yeah, Amy. Okay, so I will ask the Holocaust question because <laughs> I can't help it. Um, but yeah, it's in, there. In, it's in, there. Yeah, I mean, it's there. So in reading through, obviously, we see these authors who are um, many of whom, although not all, are writing on the brink of the Holocaust. Some of whom don't survive the Holocaust. Um, and so I guess I'll just ask you kind of a generic question of where do you see the role of the Holocaust in these stories? How does it appear? How do they deal with it? Um, and how did you deal with that, right? Also in your choosing and your translating and, and yeah. everything like that. Yeah. So I think that there were essentially two ways that Yiddish children's literature dealt with the Holocaust. Um, one was by being incredibly frank and direct. So in The Story of a Stick, that four generation novella by Tina Rabinovich that I mentioned, the last generation that we meet is a boy whose parents are presumed dead in the Holocaust. Um, they're living in Warsaw in 1939 and it, his father actually um, the, the night after his bar mitzvah is the, the day that Hitler enters Warsaw. And his father is so 
desperate to get him onto this kinder transport over the objections of his much more assimilated wife and her father that he actually drugs his own son and carries him to the collection point at the great synagogue where, where children are being put onto wagons and taken out of the city. So it's incredibly frank. I would recommend that one for a child that you think is old enough to, to deal with that sort of material. Um, there are other stories that I did not include. There's a, a whole group of stories set in the Warsaw Ghetto about the heroism of even young children in taking up arms, in smuggling, in doing whatever, smuggling food, doing whatever needed to be done to survive. Um, then there is the second sort of large category, which is dealing with the Holocaust by indirection. So there's a, a story that I didn't include. It was in the form of a rhyming poem, and it was giving me a lot of trouble, and I, I just didn't feel like I could get it across well, but there's a, a narrative poem called Nissel is Trer, Nissel is Tear, and it's about the, the, the imagery, I'm trying to remember it, I didn't translate it fully, so I don't remember it quite as well, um, but it's about all of the tears of the children falling and pooling together into one great tear. It's I don't know. I don't know that I would hand it to an American child in 2020 to, to understand more about the Holocaust. But another way that the Holocaust got dealt with indirectly was by talking about other historical violence against the Jews more removed chronologically. So the story of the life of Yitzhak Abravanel is indeed about the leader of Iberian Jewry and how he helps to shepherd the community through the expulsion from Spain in 1492. But it's also a story about European violence against the Jews. Um, you know, it's, it's published in 1941 um, and there's no way that Isaac Metzger, who, whose name you might know from the translation of the Bintel Brief, um, there's no way that he isn't also writing about Jewish resilience in the face of historical violence um, with a message for his contemporary readers in the, in the Sholem Aleichem schools. Uh, um, Thank you. Oh, sorry. Yeah, no, I had a, you. Yeah. How did you know? Yeah, no, I had another thing I wanted yeah. to say. <laughs> the other point I wanted to make is that as it does with so much of Jewish life and Jewish culture, the Holocaust um, redirects that project of Yiddish children's literature. And it starts in the 50s. There's still a lot being published, mostly in the Americas. A lot gets published in Latin America. And it Yiddish children's literature really starts to be a project of cultural consolidation and preservation. So there is a renewed emphasis on the Jewish holidays in a, in a kind of progressive secularizing key. So Tzina Rabinovich, who wrote the story of the stick, also writes a collection of holiday tales. And they focus on sort of out of the way Jewish communities that you might not expect to find described in Yiddish literature at all, such as the Jewish community of Trinidad. And the story is very frank and it says that, um, you know, Jews came to the, initially Jews came to the island um, fleeing the Inquisition and that more, and they established a small community that intermarried and sort of lost its distinctiveness over the years, um, over the, the centuries, um, but that a new generation of Jews was fleeing Hitler and they came to Trinidad and they established a, a synagogue. And there's, you know, there's a whole story about that, Senor Ferrara's first Yom Kippur. Yeah, Al, do you have a question? Yeah, I was kind of interested if you could elaborate on um, on some of the different communities that I know are 
I think are represented in the book, again, through reading mostly in the introduction, I didn't have a chance to read all the stories, um, but you mentioned those in Argentina, I think, and Cuba, as well as America. So I don't know if you perceived kind of, um, what are some of the differences that you perceived given those different political and historical, you know, cultural contexts that, that those authors found themselves in? Yeah, so that was something that it was very important to me to represent the, the kind of global or transnational nature of both places of publication and the communities being represented. So um, there is a pandemic story that is set in, um, in Casablanca in Morocco about a, a girl who makes her way to, is dropped off at a Jewish orphanage, completely traumatized by the loss of her parents in, in a pandemic. Um, and that story has a different feel to it than stories that are published in Warsaw about, about Polish Jewish life. Um, the story in, that was published in Cuba it doesn't really describe the Cuban setting, although that's kind of understood. And it's a somewhat didactic story about Lagba Omer. And it's mostly kind of a pamphlet in the form of a short story. Um, I included it because I thought the publication in Cuba was fascinating. And having a children's story about Lagba Omer could be really useful because it really gathers a lot of the, the information and the sense of Lagba Omer as this special children's holiday that I think has been kind of lost on the American Jewish community. So I, I included that one. Um, there's and another- I just have to interrupt for one second. Yeah. I'm so sorry to interrupt, but yeah. I have to say that I tried reading that one to my daughter, but look, I, hadn't, I didn't know what it was gonna be. I was just like going through like a Reddit and you know, it's really just a description. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's, like a that's historical probably, <laughs> right. That's probably the least interesting piece in the book in literary terms. Um, yeah, so but interesting because of that. Like it's interesting because it's so non liter like so not right. Nothing it is happens. So, so <laughs> pamphlety, right? I mean, a lot happens just not in the story. It's the story within the story about, you know, how Lug Momer started. Um, so nothing that's kind of distinctive to, to the story itself. Um, some of them have a very, th that sort of um, spatially, geographically indistinct fuzziness of the European fairy tale. And we see that in a few of the stories where, you know, there are kings and forests and enchanted lands, right? Um, and like, where are these stories? I don't know, in some sort of like broad European imaginary. Um, and then we have wonderfully place specific stories like the girl in the mailbox who's, who um, her father takes his daughter along to mail a letter from Buenos Aires and instead of putting the letter in the mailbox, he throws his daughter in. It was just like an absent-minded sort of, we all have those parenting days, right? When you mistakenly mail your child to Poland. So they, they bring her into the post office and the postmaster wants to like figure out how to get her back home. And the other letters and parcels that are going to Poland are really sad at the idea of having to leave the girl behind and not taking her on the adventure. And so they, they set up a collection. They're like, well, I have two cents of extra postage and I have a penny of extra postage and I have a little extra. And they raise enough money to bring the girl along on this totally fun, um, you know, sailing ship that, that this mail ship that goes to Poland and it's a really different kind of sea journey transatlantic journey than we're used to seeing represented in Jewish literature where it, you know everyone's usually in steerage and miserable and and you know getting seasick and there's a storm and are they gonna live right that's what we're used to and this is a totally fun rollicking adventure the girl goes to Poland all the different letters know where they're going she doesn't know where she's supposed to go so they send her back to Argentina and then her father shows up to claim her and all's well that ends well um
Right. Um, I'll jump in with a question, um, right. if uh, no one else is there. Uh, Miriam, thank you so much. This has such a, been such a lovely talk, and I can't wait to get my hands on a, a copy of your book. Yeah. Um, so I when you know when I, we think about 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 Yiddish and connections to to, to Yiddish culture. I think so often the the word that that comes up, particularly when I'm teaching about this, is is nostalgia, right? That there is a certain kind of nostalgic connection for um, for Eastern Europe for a time when people spoke Yiddish, um, even for folks who have no firsthand experience or even direct generational experience, right? And sometimes the images that come into people's heads are scenes from Fiddler on the Roof. Um, certain dishes that maybe Bobby cooked at home, right? Certain words that, that got used. And sometimes that nostalgia can be a little schmaltzy, right? Like sometimes it can be a little bit of a kind of romanticized understanding of, of, of Yiddish life. And I'm wondering how can, how can looking at children's literature help us to complicate that picture? Um, and get a bit more of a nuanced sense of the cultures of, of Yiddish speaking life? That's an excellent question, Laura. So last spring, um, I debuted a new course called, um, what was it called? It was called Nostalgia in Yiddish Culture, and it was interrogating exactly that. And we followed the whole Fiddler arc from the Sholem Aleichem stories to the 1939 Yiddish film Tevye to Fiddler on the Roof to Yiddish Fiddler and you know all of the byproducts and we also read Yiddish children's literature and I think the, the work that I'm doing now I'm following Honey on the Page which gives you the primary or a set of primary texts I'm following that now with a critical study of what this literature meant and what it was good for. And I think it's through that critical study, you know, really digging in and seeing that this was part of a politics, this was a strategy, and it was part of a project of cultural nationalism that kind of removes some of the, the rose colored glasses and we can begin to discern a, a real kind of geopolitical significance. I mean, insofar as Jews had geopolitical reach and aspirations, a real geopolitical significance to these stories and to what they are telling us about Yiddish culture during this period of migration when it was really becoming a transnational global culture that had a language as a portable homeland. Um, so that's one answer that we need the critical study of these tales to, to dismantle some of the reflexive nostalgia. And the second um, answer to that is that the cure for Yiddish nostalgia, right? Because it is nostalgia is a disease of, it's the sickness of longing that was first, uh, Svetlana Boim writes wonderfully about how the term was coined in the 17th century by a physician who treated Swiss mercenary soldiers who found themselves far from home, you know, fighting other people's wars. And they, they longed for the mountains of, of Switzerland. And it was like a real ache, it was, it was an illness. And so the only cure for this illness of nostalgia is learning more Yiddish. And the good news is that we are in a moment of renaissance. I'm not saying that Yiddish is going to come back as you know, a vernacular, a major vernacular language of, of the majority of, of Ashkenazi Jews. I'm not claiming that, but this is a moment when Yiddish is ascendant, Yiddish is a growth industry. If a kid who's 11 today gets turned on by this book and decides they want to study Yiddish either next year or when they go to college or during the summers in between college, there, isn't, there aren't one or two places to do that. There are multiple places to do that. And so I, I do 
hope and you know the the greatest aspiration that I have for my work on Yiddish children's literature is that it should be part of an arc of Anglophone Jews, whether they're American or, or British or wherever they happen to be, regaining some of that lost connection with Yiddish, not in a superficial nostalgic way, but in a more deeply informed way. Go ahead, Amy. Actually, that's actually a really good segue into the question that I had in mind already, which was, can you tell us something about your Yiddish journey? Right, and most, most Jews today don't grow up with Yiddish, and maybe you did, maybe you didn't. I'm curious about your, your personal Yiddish story that led you to these translations. Yeah, so I did not grow up with very much Yiddish at all. Um, I heard words here and there, and I started studying Yiddish the summer before I went to graduate school. And it was really um, kind of, I, I had a, I took a listening tour of professors that I had known during my undergraduate career. And I knew that I was interested in studying secularization and studying the role that literature played in the process of secularization, um, not as a historian, but as a literary scholar. And I had a conversation with Ruth Weiss, who ended up being my doctoral advisor. And she said, you know, you're asking a great question. And I know you want to go study all of these continental novel traditions, but secularization took place so rapidly in the Jewish world that often within a single generation, you would see this leap from um, like a really robust traditional religious identity to a fully secular identity. And the record of that is in Yiddish. And I think you're gonna learn Yiddish really easily because Yiddish retzich, Yiddish speaks itself. Um, so she sent me off, you know, she gave me, she actually brought me a copy of the Weinreich textbook, which is all there was at that time from, from 1948. Now, you know, the, part of this Renaissance is that we have a publishing boom in, in Yiddish textbooks. Um, but uh, I went to the YIVO summer program and then I just kind of took off from there. I had excellent teachers. The people who are teaching Yiddish tend to be excellent, um, really committed to it, really knowledgeable. Thank you. I mean, I did the YIVO program and I did, that's where I started and I did the Vilna program back in the day and everything. So yeah, I was very curious yeah. to hear about, yeah, your process as well. It looks like um, Ariana wants to know what is my favorite children's story and why, which is kind of like asking, which is your favorite child? Um, it's very, it's very hard to, to choose one. Um, but I will say that, you know, in the same way that you go through a challenge with, with your children, whether it's one who takes a long time to learn to sleep independently or who has to be coaxed to eat or who has trouble with, with speech and needs speech therapy. And whatever sort of travail you've gone through with that child, you, you end up feeling very attached and loving and connected around that aspect of them. So like the child who had to be coaxed to eat, once they're a little older and they can eat for themselves and you see them really like tuck into a, a good bowl of chulent or soup or a plate of salad and enjoy it. And you're like, ah, oh, such a triumph. So I feel the same way about these translations. It, it's not so much a matter of which stories do I, do I love, but it's more like, the passages that I struggled over and sweated over um, and you know had to, in some cases, do research for. I remember those passages and I feel pleasure um, every time I get to read them and they sound like actual English to me. Are there any? Oh. Mark asks, 
You write beautiful prose. Have you written any fiction for adults or children? Thank you. I have not figured out fiction at this point. Um, I haven't really had bandwidth to try. It's something I would love to try someday. I'm also thinking about um, trying some adaptations of these children's stories to put them into a little bit more modern key. Um, but I think I'm probably, um, not I'm probably, I know that I'm thus far a much stronger essayist than I am a fiction writer. Um, I have some essays here and there. Leah or Leah? I have, I have another thought. Um, Yiddish is a real fun language. And when you read it in the original, I think it's so rich. And I think you, you sound like you did a really, um, you really struggled with finding the right translations to give that over. And you probably did a, an amazing job. I'm also itching to get my hands on your book. Um, but I'm wondering like sometimes to like include just like one verse here and there of the original Yiddish, if it would lend itself to more, to a more authentic feel. Yeah, so there are places where um, I'll include a phrase, um, usually not so much of the straight Yiddish because that's what I'm trying to translate, but sometimes there will be a Hebrew phrase embedded in the Yiddish. And since it's a little bit of a foreign element in the Yiddish, I feel justified in keeping it as a little bit of a foreign element in the English. So for example, um, we have the story by Yankov Pot of the Magic Lion. Um, this one actually did appear uh, an adaptation. This is a story that's been told many times by many different people. And there was an adaptation that appeared in English a few years ago as a picture book. And this is the one about the rabbi who's going through the desert and he's going on a journey that has to include a Sabbath. And so he joins a caravan and he contracts with somebody. He makes the contract with somebody um, who's going to stay with him while the rest of the caravan moves on over the Sabbath, over Friday night and Saturday with their travels. And then the two of them will catch up. And the other guy backs out. And he has to face this decision. Do I stay alone in the desert for the Sabbath or do I keep moving for my safety with the caravan? And he decides to stay put. And he has his challahs and his nice Shabbat clothes and he, he gets them out and he puts them on and he sings Lecha Doidi. He sings Lecha Doidi. He sings the, the Friday night prayer. And I decided that I could leave the phrase, you know, the Hebrew phrase to give the flavor of it, um, even though everything else is being rendered into English. Um, needless to say, he ends up spending the Sabbath with a wonderful, friendly lion, and they have a terrific time together. And he is able to catch up to the caravan through the good offices of the lion, but I won't tell you exactly how. The Sabbath lion, right, that's it. So, so thanks, but I, I wasn't I wasn't referring to that before you oh. mentioned about the Beza Bays. Yeah. And, and mm -hmm. in that book, I thought like if you figure out how to translate it, but just like to put like near it those really cute, fun Yiddish phrases, um, just for the people, maybe for those that understand and get an extra. Ah, so for those who have Yiddish, have I got a gift for you? Um, last week, I created a, a folder that right now lives on Google Drive, but it's eventually going to live on the New York University Press website um, that collates all of the Yiddish originals with a document telling you the page numbers where you can find each story in the Yiddish. So if you have Yiddish and you want to teach with this or you know share it with children, um, I've made it really accessible. And you can email me afterwards and I'll be happy to just send you that, that Google folder. Annette? You're muted, Phil. 
Thank you. Uh, when you talked about trying to translate the Bates of Bates and all that, uh, can you say just a few words about the Harry Potter Yiddish version? Yeah, sure. Um, Aaron is a good friend and I, I love the project. This is um, somebody who is a native speaker who took the first book of Harry Potter and translated it into English and it completely sold out its first printing. I think now they're actually in the third printing. There has been a you know, really enthusiastic response and he did all kinds of clever things um, with Quidditch and, and all, all sorts of, of you know, wonderful things that he embedded to, to kind of play with, with the language. It's a fantastic project. There's a, um, a question in the chat, which is what inspired you to pursue rabbinical studies at Yeshiva Maharat and are there linkages with your interest in Yiddish culture and secularization? Yeah, um, that honestly, the question about the linkages is something that I'm still really working out for myself. And I think that when I, when I finish the critical study of, of Yiddish children's literature, the next project is actually going to be a kind of working through of what one of my favorite Yiddish poets, Itzik Manger, called literatoire, which is a portmanteau word of literatur, literature, and Torah, right? And, and what it means for me to read texts that were written mostly by secularizing authors. In other words, if we assume that um, secularization is a, a kind of a, like a, an asymptotic thing. It never goes all the way to zero. You can always be secularizing, but you can never be fully secular. What does it mean to be fully secular, right? So it's always a kind of asymptotic thing of it's approaching, but it doesn't quite get there necessarily. Um, but what does it mean to be reading texts that were the product of a secularizing consciousness as somebody whose Jewish life looks fairly traditional, um, who's on the other side of a kind of vast historical gap. And it's something that I'm just starting to sort of like think about, you know, as I'm lying in bed at night, unable to to sleep because of the state of the world in the country. Like this is kind of where my thoughts are running. But as far as the first question, um, you know, it, it's kind of unusual that you have an event in your life that's going to bifurcate your life and you know that it's coming, right? There are a lot of events that end up bifurcating our lives into a before and an after, but they take us by surprise. We, we don't have time to plan for them, but when you, go through the tenure process, you know that there's going to be this big high stakes decision and you're either going to get to continue doing this thing you love or you're going to have to try to find something else that you love to do that instead. And like you have in mind that you need to have a plan B. And I remember being in the probationary period, the period before tenure and thinking, well, okay, now it's becoming possible for women to become rabbis in the Orthodox community, maybe that's something I would have wanted to do, you know, if I hadn't done this other thing. So I have the seed of a thought then. Um, and I also had the idea that if I did get tenure, I had two goals. One was to resume Torah scholarship on a high level that I had enjoyed as a young adult and I had to kind of set aside during the, the years of having very young children and being on the tenure clock. And the other was learning Russian. Um, I have not gotten very far with Russian, although I started Duolingo, but shortly after being tenured, I got a letter inviting me to apply for the first cohort of this new program at Yeshivat Maharat. And I said, that was made for me. And I just went for it. So that's, that's how that happened. Oh, crazy things happen all the time. All sorts of deserving people have wild, you know, ugh, contingency of the beast. Crazy things happen. 
but yes, I feel very fortunate that they did grant me tenure. <laughs> Other questions? You all have gotten me out of bedtime. That was our secret plan. We didn't tell you, but like that was the agenda for the evening. <laughs> I also got out of bed time for this. The jury's still out in my house. <laughs> I have the kids that have all of the travails that you mentioned before. Yeah. yeah. I was going to ask you, uh, Margo, if you had any other, if you were going anywhere else, because we got really into all the questions. So um, I, I see that there's one more about book fairs. And so at the moment, I am on a 30 stop virtual tour. Um, and not all of the events are public and not all of the events are in English, but it's I'm trying to keep up with everything on my website. So if you go to miriamudel.com and look at the events, that will have the upcoming um, public event next week. I'm sort of in your part of the country at the University of Chicago, um, once in English to adults, once in Yiddish for adults, and once for in English for children. So you're not coming to Detroit for book fair virtually or Ann Arbor or? If they it's invited fun. me, I would come. Okay. Ann Arbor, yes. I'm at the Ann Arbor um, Jewish Book Fair. I am indeed. Okay. Yeah. Um, it, it is 8.30, so I'm going to let anybody who wants to go go. But maybe if there are people who want to stick around and chat, Miriam, can you stick around and chat for a few minutes if anybody I wants can to stick stay? around. I'm I think there's also like, going Mark to just, still has his hand up. <laughs> I'll give a quick shout out to Paula Cohen, the illustrator, oh, yeah, um, who did this beautiful cover that references many of the stories in the book. And she also created these amazing black and white illustrations. So here is the rabbi atop the lion that oh. I mentioned. Yeah. Um, yeah, so 